Brendan, do you want to pin the hosts and panelists? Sorry, what? Did we pin the hosts and panelists? What do you mean? Pin, pin them? Ping them? Yeah, in Zoom. I guess people could also just pin them on their own. OK. If you know how to do that, then, then go for it, yeah. All right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our E11 Scholars Panel. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This is uh, the Scholarship Opportunities Program. We're delighted to have you. Uh, my name is Brendan Park. I'm a scholarship uh, advisor and writing specialist with the Scholarship Opportunities Program. Uh, and I'm joined tonight uh, by our other staff members, our other scholarship advisor and writing specialist, Teresa Nguyen and also our two student advisors, our expert student advisors, Aline Pham and Isha Sharma. Uh, and tonight in our panel, we're gonna give a brief presentation of our SOP services. Um, and then we're going to introduce our scholars. Uh, we have four panelists tonight who've won some of our E11 awards who are gonna be talking to us. Uh, and then after that, we will have a um, discussion with our panelists and then a Q&A. Uh, at the at the end of the panel tonight. Um, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Aline and Isha to, to present on SOP. Hi, everyone. My name is Aline, and I'm SOP's lead student advisor. I will be presenting first on what SOP does. Can I have the next slide, please? So who's SOP? The Scholarship Opportunities Program supports sophomores to recent alumni in applying to prestigious merit-based scholarships by, by editing essays, sharing past winning apps, and conducting mock interviews, among other advising services. Scholarship agencies also task our office with endorsing candidates for their scholarships. An endorsement is basically like a stamp of approval from UCI. But make sure not to confuse us with the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships, or OFAS, because we don't advise for UCI-awarded scholarships. In fact, the majority of our awards do not require financial need except for the Beinecke. Next, Isha will be going over um, the SOP advising process. Hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Brendan introduced, my name is Isha Sharma, and I'm a student advisor for SOP. Um, so as you can see here, our advising process has five steps, the first of which is exploration at the bottom there. Um, during this phase, applicants enroll in a short personal discovery course called SOP Prep. Uh, this course is required if you'd like to take advising through our office, and it helps you outline your academic, professional, and scholarship goals to prepare you for the application process. Um, our panelists can elaborate on the rest of the advising components, but now we'll move on to specific potential scholarships. Um, so we have a few scholarships for public service uh, for related to public service. The first one, the Strauss Scholarship. Um, this one has no citizen restric restrictions, um, and it's for students that are graduating in 2023 or 2024. Um, it provides $8,000 for original community service projects and then $7,000 for undergraduate tuition and fees. Our next, next scholarship, the Udall Scholarship, uh, is for US citizens who want to lead environmental sustainability and policy efforts, or Native American tribe members who want to resolve healthcare or tribal policy issues with, na within Native American nations. Um, and this is also for students graduating in 2023 or 2024. And then our Truman Scholarship is for US citizens planning to graduate in 2023 um, and enter government or nonprofit, nonprofit work in leadership roles. Um, recipients of this scholarship have clear goals for grad school and the future and substantial leadership experience, whether that be founding clubs or nonprofits, holding elected positions and serving on political campaigns. Um, and you must be able to reflect this leadership experience um, and write a policy proposal for the scholarship. And our next slide. Um, and then we have the CA Capital Fellows. Um, this scholarship is rooted in expert, 
experiential learning and public service, Capital Fellows spend 10 to 11 months as part of a cohort working in legislative, executive, um, or judicial branch offices and receive a monthly stipend of around $3,000 and as well as healthcare benefits. Um, and then our NIH National Institute of Health Scholarship offers competitive scholarships to students from disadvantaged backgrounds who are committed to pursuing careers in biomedical, behavioral, and social science related research. Um, recipients work at the NIH in the summer after each scholarship awarded year and are fully employed for one year after graduation for each year of the scholarship. And then our NOAA scholarship is intended to prepare students for public service careers uh, with NOAA and other national resource and science agencies at the federal, state, and local levels of government. Um, students will receive a 10-week paid internship between the first and second years of this award. And then our last award, the SMART Scholarship, um, the Department of Defense Science and Technology Workforce seeks STEM students for full-time employment after graduation. This service requirement is one-to-one, -one, meaning for each awarded year, students work a year at a DOD sponsoring facility, um, and then they also intern in the summer before graduation. And for this one, you can apply any year, but you must be at least one and a half years away from graduation. And then I'll let Aline take it for the last few. Okay, so on to scholarships for academics and research. First, we have the Goldwater, which is for US citizens graduating in 2023 or 24 who exhibit excellence in scientific research. Above here is Leandra Jackson, who is both a Goldwater and Gates scholar. Secondly, we have Killam, which is for US citizens graduating in the same 23 or 24 years who want to study abroad in Canada. UCI nominates students participating in direct exchange with McGill University in Canada. Thirdly, the Beinecke is for US citizens who intended to graduate study, who intend graduate study in arts, humanities, and social sciences, but not neuroscience. Applicants must be graduating in 2023 and have a history of receiving need-based financial aid. This is Margaret Farrell, who was is a grad student and a Beinecke scholar. And finally, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Junior Fellows is a research internship program that requires substantial research experience and a brief written policy analysis. Some positions do require foreign language fluency or quantitative economic skills. And that wraps up all of our scholarships for the E11 cycle. Next, we will show you the pre-application deadlines. So somebody will be pasting the link in the chat and on that web page, you'll be able to see all the deadlines. Um, they're either November 8th or October 25th of this year. All right, thank you so much. And now uh, we'll turn it over to Teresa to introduce uh, our first two scholar panelists for tonight. All right, so we're so excited to have four um, SOP scholars um, with us to share their experiences. And there will be time for you to hear about their experiences and ask questions as well. So our first panelist is Stephen Gong, who is a third year triple major in human bio, econ and poli sci. His immigrant background and child's experiences with the US health system has fueled his commitment to the idea of healthcare as a fundamental human right. Stephen has won the Strauss Scholarship for his project to establish the California Health Advocacy Network, a youth ambassador-based subsidiary of California Physicians Alliance, which seeks to address health coverage and disparities throughout California. He aspires to work as a physician advocate and a public service within the US Public Health Service. Our second panelist is Karisha, Karishma Muthukumar, who is a senior studying cognitive sciences and biology, the founder of The Patient Project, a globally available reflections. She has been recognized and funded as a Barnes and Noble College Scholar, as well as a Strauss Scholar. And in 2019, she was appointed a Dalai Lama Fellow and was also named Young In Innovator to Watch at CES, where she developed one of the top ideas during the NSF, the National Science Foundation's Open Call for Future Scientific Direction. Krishma has also found time to be a peer mentor or peer tutor in OCHEM, an ambassador at the Center for Neurobiology, Learning and Memory, and the founder of a nonprofit for neuroscience education and outreach. 
she aspires to combine her interest in health and public service towards a meaningful career in healthcare. Great. And Lucy Yang is a senior Regent Scholar, double majoring in chemistry and biological sciences with a minor in creative writing. She's a recipient of the Goldwater Scholarship, founder and artist for the Kauai Chemist, and a member of the Chemistry Club and the American Chemical Society. She plans to pursue a PhD in chemical biology. And finally, we are also joined by Pratush Muthukumar. Uh, Pratush is a UCI Alumni Association Scholar and Senior Transfer Student Studying Computer Science. He is a recipient of the Goldwater Scholarship who researches deep learning for empathy-based AI at UCI and has worked as a student researcher with the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and is the lead researcher on a joint project to monitor air pollution sponsored by NASA and the city of Los Angeles. He plans to pursue graduate work in computer science. All right. Uh, so now we can jump into our questions. Uh, so panelists, we're, we're hoping each of you can, can answer the questions as we go through. We don't have to go in a set order. Whoever wants to answer first can jump in. Um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and start with um, Aline asking, asking our first question for tonight. Yes. So can you explain why you decided to apply for the scholarship and what sorts of pros and cons you weighed during the decision making? Steven, you want to or go ahead? Yeah, so uh, first, thank you, Brendan, for the kind introduction. Uh, I guess I'll take a shot at this question. Uh, so I think um, when I first started looking into the uh, to various external scholarships I should apply for um, through the UCI Scholarship Opportunities Program, uh, most of them are split into two main categories, either service or research, um, or sort of those are the broad categories. There might be some that overlap or some that are a little bit different, but um, so first I sort of narrowed down, you know, which one would be the best to my, my skills or which one do I feel I have the greatest strengths in? And uh, from my previous experiences, uh, uh, with my previous research experiences, I found that I had a stronger set, uh, a, str uh, a strength in research. So I decided that a research-based uh, scholarship would be a good one to apply for. And then naturally, uh, one of the, the most prestigious, prestigious and one of the top undergraduate research scholarships is the Goldwater Scholarship. And so if uh, you're interested in research or you're currently doing research, I definitely would recommend um, the Goldwater Scholarship if you are uh, dedicated to undergraduate research. Uh, so that's sort of how I, I got my bearings around which one to choose. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, other panelists have a similar uh, approach or similar experiences. Yeah, I can add on to that. Thanks, Pratush, and thank you, uh, SOP, for the kind introduction. Uh, for the Strauss Scholarship, I was a sophomore at the time uh, last year, and so the Strauss Scholarship, uh, you have to sort of figure out what you're eligible first. That's always one of the big contenders, and then you can separate it into you know research or service. For me, uh, I felt like my strengths in service were definitely more prominent compared to my research interests. So when applying for the Strauss scholarship, the biggest thing was in terms of pros and cons was the time commitment, because it takes time to create a timeline, to research, to sort of develop your narrative, because you're, as an applicant, you have to sort of summarize who you are and then you know, align that with the goals of the scholarship. And so uh, pros would definitely be, I mean, being able to start my own sort of nonprofit and do these initiatives that I would have never been able to even dream of. And then cons just, really scheduling and taking that extra time because SOP scholarship prep really is um, like an extra class, you know? Yeah, I also applied for the Strauss scholarship, which is service-based. Um, and I think I was really drawn to that because it was a chance to implement a project and to really um, bring an idea to reality. Um, so I was really interested in, in the Strauss scholarship in that sense. And I think in terms of pros, I'd say, um, yeah, just like Stephen mentioned, it is a lot of experiential learning, like you're able to learn a lot about sort of how to bring a project to reality. Um, and on top of that, also mentorship, you're able to learn a lot from other people and sort of 
um, the, the people in the community that you form. And I think the con is probably an obvious one, like just like the fear of failure, like the fear of not um, of taking a risk and sort of putting yourself out there and then not really like um, receiving the scholarship or, or not receiving a favorable outcome. Um, but I think, and this is sort of something that I'll um, sort of elaborate on more is that this is this supposed con is kind of like a pro in that you're able to to really learn from the experience and to really um, it, it's it's you're able to reflect on a lot of things that you might not be reflecting on otherwise. Um, for me, um, low key. Um, oh, first of all, thank you, Brandon, for the glorious introduction. But for me, in all honesty, I kind of applied to the Goldwater on a whim. Um, I'm lucky to have, so in my lab, um, my then graduate student mentor, she just got her, P um, she just graduated with her PhD in chemistry this summer, but she was a Goldwater scholar um, as an undergrad. So she told me, she's like, hey, um, check, I'm like, um, so I'm, I'm a Goldwater scholar. Um, you should go check to see like what UCI opportunities UCI has for that. I think it'd be a good fit. And I think that I'll just snowball from there. Um, I totally agree with what Karishma said. Um, if you don't get it, it is a learning experience. So I kind of applied um, kind of blindly, I would say. Um, as like a win-win. I'm like, if I get it, it's um, it's a it's an absolute honor and um, it's it also alleviates financial burden. But if I don't get it, it's a great learning experience. Um, yes, of course, it's gonna hurt, but um, you get it's I feel like um, I'm so much prepared, much more prepared as I start my graduate school applications, as um, I actually shortly after the Goldwater I applied and fortunately received another research based fellowship and the whole entire process that you go through in, a, in into applying to these prestigious scholarships is that you really learn how to write about yourself, how to write about your research, how to write about your service projects. Um, and that entire experience isn't just a one-time thing. You're going to have to keep applying these skills to everything else you apply for. So I would say that's the biggest pro. Um, the biggest con, I would say, is honestly, it's hard to write about yourself sometimes, <laughs> especially your accomplishments. And especially, it's especially hard if you're like me and you struggle with imposter syndrome. Um, that was really difficult for me to kind of just create a narrative about myself and it is a lot of time um you do um as, as steven said you dedicate almost like the equivalent of like a two or three unit class to just working on your materials rough drafts um second draft so that's it's just it's a really big time commitment Okay, thank you all for sharing that. Um, we'll move on to our second question. So can you describe your relationship with faculty and other mentors and how they have played a role in your application process and overall academic journey? Uh, okay, so uh, let me go for this one again. Uh, so I think faculty or getting to know your faculty um, as an undergrad is extremely, extremely important, uh, whether it is for applying for graduate school later, or well, if you're in this meeting, then you're probably interested in applying for a scholarship as well. So I think nearly all scholarships uh, from the SOP program require uh, letters of recommendation or some interaction with that, uh, faculty. So uh, apart from reference letters, getting to know your faculty is a great thing to expand your, uh, your understanding or your involvement in the community as an undergrad or, or uh, however you are. Um, so my relationship uh, with my research mentors have been very close. I, I meet with them regularly weekly, uh, if not more some weeks. And so the, the process of developing or constructing a research project from scratch, uh, thinking of an idea, you know, for this, for the scope of uh, research-based scholarships, uh, which I'm talking about, uh, for research mentors, the process of uh, of creating a research project, formulating that research project, uh, developing the methodology, testing some results, all of that is a very long and uh, tedious process. But it really brings you closer to understanding the expertise of your faculty um, or or your mentor, and also it really enhances your 
your involvement with the community um, as an undergrad there. So uh, I would say that in, in the application process, it was very simple and, and very straightforward almost. It was free flowing for me to, to let my faculty mentors know, you know, I wanna apply for a research-based scholarship and they were all for it. They, they, they thought it would be a great idea. And so, um, you know, when you, when you start working with uh, faculty mentors uh, in terms of research and you, and you work for them for a year or two, um, or work, work with them on a project, then they would be all but more happy to, to help you in your uh, application process. And then also they would be uh, happy to help you review uh, your research uh, or your research statements, because one big part of the Goldwater Scholarship is you have to write a research article or basically a, a statement about your research experiences um, in a scientific format. And so I sent many revisions to my faculty mentor uh, going back and forth uh, uh, with my research mentor on, on our research to, to really perfect that research statement. And in my opinion, I believe that that research statement is especially useful for the, the Goldwater Applications Admissions Committee. So um, I, I really believe that they helped me uh, in, in, in securing uh, or, or receiving the Goldwater Scholarship. Um, to kind of but um, piggyback off of what Prakash says, um, I would, um, it goes without saying that I wouldn't be a Goldwater Scholar without all my faculty mentors. Um, they've been great. Again, I don't know how many drafts my Goldwater research proposal went through from my very first draft to the one I submitted. Um, I feel like that it's very important to build um, a trusting relationship with the faculty mentors because you should know that um, they, even though you're like, oh my God, they're professors, they've been where we are now. They've been undergrads. They've gone through the process of applying to grads. So yes, and they've been a, like some time ago, but um, they understand you to some degree. And I feel like um, as students, um, we should understand that and knowing and we should be able to not be unafraid to reach out when we want help academically research wise um, for other applications and for the most part they genuinely want to help you out because both in like a way both in a selfish and in a selfless way selfless because they want to see you succeed they want to see you do well and also selfish because it also reflects on your research mentor if one of their mentees wins something as big as a let's say like a goldwater or Strauss scholar or any of these big scholarships so just don't be afraid to reach out and i'm pretty sure nine out of ten of the time they would be um they are appreciated if we do reach out I can speak a little bit more to the uh, service scholarship side. So specifically for my Strauss uh, application cycle, we were online. So it was a lot harder to build relationships with professors. Um, the biggest thing I can offer is that definitely, you know, maybe stay a minute or two after class, talk with the professor and, you know, go to office hours. Like everyone says it, go to office hours. Even if you don't have a question, go to office hours. Um, get to not only connect with your professor as a human, but, you know, eventually you'll be able to align your interests. So for that, for me, that was like medicine, public service. And so, um, you know, even though I had the Strauss scholarship in mind, it made sense um, their eye, in their eyes for me to apply. And so uh, I specifically had a mentor in the business school. Um, they were in, they were in the healthcare sphere, you know, they taught healthcare management classes. And so it really helps be able to connect these um, these ideas that I had with you know real world problems and uh, you know proposed solutions in order that they could review in order for me to have a successful scholarship cycle. And so being able to really take classes with them and then just having everything align um, with that narrative that you're building, I definitely think that building those relationships, whether online, in person, or whatnot. Um, now, very crucial because they can, you know, you can speak to um, your qualities and your experiences, but your professors are going to be able to bring anecdotes and back that up for you, which is invaluable. Yeah, to add on to that, I'd say um, faculty support and mentorship is, is sort of really central. Um, and I, 
I also agree that like sometimes like the first few times in office hours, like I wasn't really sure um, like how the interactions were supposed to go or I was kind of confused. Um, but it's always important to sort of start somewhere and start some time, right? And so usually um, you'd want to start soon. Um, and in my case, actually, it was my faculty mentor who really encouraged me to apply for the scholarship. Um, like I wasn't sure that I would be able to sort of apply or I wasn't sure if the idea was um, feasible. Um, but in my case, the faculty mentor really did encourage me. And so that was kind of like a stepping stone and, and it was really a way for me to apply. Um, and so I'd say faculty can help in, in both supporting you and also mentoring you. So in some cases, like the discussions with faculty mentors could actually lead to ideas. Um, so for example, like a service project idea, or it could lead to not just like during this and also during the scholarship year, right? So while you're implementing the scholarship um, and while you're implementing the um, project, you're able to discuss with faculty mentors and sort of get an idea of like what steps to go and sort of where to go um, from there. So it's it, it's kind of a, a, a sort of a lifetime um, sort of mentorship. And I, and I and definitely recommend um, finding finding faculty that are that are definitely there to support you. All right, thank you so much. So uh, our third question is, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about applying for similar awards? Is there anything you know now, having gone through the process and winning it, um, that you wish you knew when you first started applying? I can go for this first for this one. Um, so, Definitely, when I first started college, there are just so many opportunities out there, so many scholarships, so many, um, you know, so many just internships, opportunities, whatever you call it, so many things for you to go do out there. Um, my advice for someone that would want to think about applying for similar awards is as soon as you can, try to think about, you know, try to reflect on what you're passionate about and what your life experiences have taught you so that you can figure out where you eventually want to go um, as a career. And specifically, I sort of manifested this in a uh, in like a four year plan. Right. So as a freshman, I was like, OK, well, here's what I'm thinking about. Um, I'm interested in healthcare. So here's the real, here's the things, the paths that I can take and what that really helps you do it. Number one, it helps you figure out who you are, what you want to do, you know, and a lot of us, that question is not to, um, you know, it's always a work in progress. But number two, that allows you to, again, build this sort of profile and narrative of someone that's very passionate about your field um, and pursuing those opportunities that align with your interests um, that allows you to build a very competitive application that eventually, you know, that just might win it. And so something that I wish I knew when I first started, um, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about these things. Um, even if you have it in the back of your mind, you're able to look for new opportunities, you know, if it's constantly there. And through that, you're always going to be able to, um, you know, pursue that next step forward to realize what you're truly passionate about and what impact you want to have. Yeah, uh, I would say that um, usually uh, for, for when you're thinking about applying to these type of external awards, um, it's good to think about maybe some things that are unique about yourself or things that you might think that this makes me somewhat uh, non-traditional or different from other applicants. Um, and sometimes it may be something that's keeping you as an, as something that's an obstacle, but you can usually turn that around to make it as a strength. Uh, like for example, I'm I'm a transfer student, and so uh, usually when when you apply or, or or the the Goldwater scholarship when you apply is a, or when you start the application with the SOP office is in October, and I transferred in in September, so I had a basically a month of leeway between when I first uh, started at UCI and uh, when I started applying to the to the Gold Goldwater scholarship. So uh, some things that may feel like it's it's something that sets you apart or is different. Uh, it's, it's good to start thinking about how to twist or turn that into um, your own personal hook or your own personal tagline. 
right? So uh, another another one that I, I sort of use is because I'm uh, the the, for, the place where I transferred from is an early college program. So actually, I, I skipped high school, and so uh, I'm currently 17 years old. And, and so as as a younger student, as a non traditional uh, student, um, you know, it's hard to get get acquainted uh, acquaintance with with a new community uh, with, with peers uh, um, right, right as you transfer as well. So it can be difficult to, to jump over those roadblocks. But uh, I would say uh, if anyone is, is thinking about those sort of roadblocks that, that might be there or something that's uh, in the back of their mind that, that, might, that they might be thinking it's, it's not a good uh, or they might not be a good fit for the, the scholarship, usually you're able to turn that around and use that as your selling point. And so, uh, that, that's sort of the advice I would give is, is find something that's unique about yourself and, and really market that uh, when you're applying to these types of uh, scholarships. And another thing that I wish I knew uh, then when I was applying that I know now is that the SOP program is awesome. Uh, it's a really great resource. And actually the SOP program is uh, the UCI SOP office. They're able to help you find that, that, that thing that can that takes your application to the next level and, and gives you your tagline. So I would definitely recommend uh, just, if, even if you're not sure about uh, applying for, for scholarships to, to check out the uh, SOP office um, and, and they have really great resources that I think could be helpful for anyone. Um, I think I have something again very similar to Katish. Um, I, I just said believe in yourself. I think there is a genuine portion. I mean, um, I can, I mean, this is a story for another day, but um, fall quarter 2020, when I applied for the Goldwater, wasn't the most glorious quarter for me. And then there was like periods along like my application journey where I like kind of wanted to give up because um, I looked at the past applicants and I looked at their resumes and I'm like, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> um, and then if I were to go back and tell myself anything is don't compare yourself to like previous winners. I mean, I'm not saying like don't look at the applications because maybe but look at them in a way of like, how did they sell themselves? How did they present themselves and compare yourself that way? Like, how can I like write about my passions, my interests in a way that can that's useful. Don't look at past winning applicants as look what they did, because your journey is different than my journey, which is different than, than Patricia's journey, which is different from everyone's journey, who's probably has, like, we might have won one. So like Patricia and I, we might have won the same scholarship, but our journeys are completely different. And so will yours. And, and, and your journey will be completely different from ours don't compare yourself that way because that's only going to cause you self-doubt and we don't have time for self-doubt in this economy. Um, we, so I, I just really want to say, like, if I go back, I just want to tell myself and tell all of you to believe in yourself, um, go for it. Um, that, and, um, and that you are deserving, even though you might not feel like it, even though it might not seem like it, um, because in reality, it's yes, it's a scholarship op, um, application. Yes, they do will look at like the numbers and the CVs and resumes. But in my opinion, more so, it's of like um, an evaluation of how you can present yourself as a person. So like you can do it, just put in your best effort, and the um, um, and you will be able to see the reward. Yeah, to add on to that, if you're if you're thinking about applying, I definitely recommend um, applying because it is sort of a scheduled time to to think about career goals and to really solidify like what directions you'd like to pursue, um, and and kind of like what Lucy was mentioning, almost everyone has the perception that there's like one aspect of or like one criteria that's lacking. Um, so th the the advice there is just really to apply. And um, if I were to, to apply again, I would say, I would ask questions from students, um, from faculty and, and also from SOP um, because it is, it is really a great resource. And obviously there's like websites and there's plenty of written material and there's the internet and you can look things up. Um, but I think just 
having conversations with people, like you do learn a lot um, from people and from the community here at UCI. Great. Um, and say so I'm trying to paste in the chat at the same time. Uh, can you talk about um, applying for prestigious scholarships and how it's influenced uh, you're thinking about your academic and career goals. Um, I think I can start off with this one again. Um, I started for another time. I was going through like a really, like looking back at it, I'm like, yep, that's an existential crisis. Because um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in the, future, in the future around like, I would say like early fall 2020. Um, as I said, I applied to the Goldwater on a whim, and um, the Goldwater is a research-based scholarship, and then um, one of, I don't want to say a criteria, but um, they would like to see their applicants um, aspire to obtain like a research-based degree, so like a PhD degree or an MD, MD PhD degree, and go on to become like academics, like leading the future of research or whatever field you're a part of, and then I felt like um, Winning the gold water for me was a, like a form of validation. Um, I think before then, I didn't feel like I belonged in the field. I knew that I really liked the research I was doing, but I'm like, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm never going to make a career out of this. But I think like after winning the gold water scholarship, I think I took it almost like as a sign from some higher being or like a sign from the world that um, I was meant to be here. And then afterwards, I felt like, I, like my academic, like my academic goals shifted. It was a very like, um, almost a tangible reason for me to pursue the path that I am pursuing now, which is, um, an, which is essentially an, an academic career um, in, the, in the biophysical sciences. Um, and then I feel like thinking wise, uh, Again, I think I mentioned earlier in one of my earlier answers, it's really helped me like in the way of thinking like how I present myself and how I um, talk about my research because those are skills that if you, if you choose to go down this field, you're, it's gonna stick with you for like the next 50 years. Yeah, uh, I don't have too much to add. I think Lucy summed it up uh, pretty good. Uh, but something that, that I also think uh, is good is that these applying for these prestigious scholarships are sort of, um, or when I, when I started applying before, before I wasn't sure if, you know, if I were, I were good enough to, to receive the scholarship or usually the scholarship, uh, uh, the acceptance, uh, the, the percentages are very low. So it's very hard, it's very easy to get, feel a lot of doubt about whether I would get this scholarship or not. Um, but when I first started it um, or started the application process, I sort of thought of it as a trial run for my graduate applications later because I knew I already wanted to go into or apply to graduate school. And so after uh, winning the scholarship, um, and even if I didn't win the scholarship, I think that going through the process really helped me fine tune what I wanted to do and how I should write my statements of purpose for my graduate applications, which, I, which I'm doing right now. So um, uh, it is just the process of applying to these scholarships are very enriching and, and helpful for your future career goals. Um, that's certainly been the case for me. And um, in, in terms of uh, my thinking it, about, my, about my academic and career goals, I think uh, writing down so many times, uh, you know, what I want to be, or my future career aspirations, or uh, what my proposed graduate research should be, or uh, what what I want to do in my um, with with the research in my in my future career, writing that down uh, so many times, doing so many re revisions for for these uh, prestigious scholarships that I'm applying for, uh, it really helps me again figure out my own personal uh, niche that I can brand myself into, and figure out the line of work that makes me unique, um, not just for uh, within applying for a scholarship, but also in my future career, when I'm uh, 
when I'm when I'm in my uh, future career, I can have this uh, personal personal experience or personal uh, niche that I myself can rely on um, that 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 sets me apart from others. So uh, I think applying for these scholarships really helps you find what's unique about yourself and really market that or exhibit that to everyone. Thank you. So to build on that, um, we are we would like your thoughts on this um, situation. So a chance to win and receive money and prestige are obvious benefits that many people associate with scholarships. Um, but we would love to hear about other meaningful reasons to apply. So some of you have touched on that a little bit, but we'd love you to dig in a little bit more. So in what ways has your scholarship experience helped you grow personally, professionally, and academically? I can add on to this one. Uh, the scholarships, when you're viewing it from the scholarship committee side, they get so many applicants, so many competitive applicants, so many amazing people. And it's really easy to feel imposter syndrome, especially when you read previous applications or uh, previously accepted applicants. Um, something that I've really meaningfully gained from the entire scholarship process is the sense of direction of where I want to go in your life. You know, it's not exactly um, you know, it's not like you want to figure out your, you want to become like a cardiothoracic surgeon or something, right? But you have like some sort of direction that you want to go in. And that's the most important part, because as long as you have a direction, then, you know, you can keep whittling it down until you find that your specific niche and what your narrative brings you to. So personally, just going through this entire scholarship application process, it just shows me how um, valuable each person's story is. And it's really about how you frame it. Um, what's most meaningful to you? What is um, what is important to you when, in terms of like personal and professional goals, right? And then the scholarship committees evaluate that and, you know, upon receiving them or even just going through the process, you get more direction um, just in terms of where you eventually want to end up. Yeah, to add on to that, like from a service scholarship standpoint, um, sort of the scholarship experience offers um, leadership experience too. And then um, it's also like about your memories of as an anteater, right? So you're able to really um, form a lot of experiences and memories and, and sort of learn from the scholarship experience. Um, so whether that's like recruitment, team building, community outreach, um, there are just so many aspects that you learn that is like outside of like the classroom, outside of the lecture hall. Um, so like, yes, I do study biology and, and cognitive science, but I think I've learned so much just from the, the scholarship experience that it's almost like another education um, while I'm here at UCI. Um, I think for me, other than like the whole like, oh, it's a great experience, it's like almost like a practice graduate school application. Um, another really great thing kind of touches back to one of the earlier questions about relationships with um, faculty and other mentors. Um, you can't get through a scholarship. Um, scholarship application alone and I felt like uh, my relationships with all of our mentors really strengthened through that because I had to talk to some special faculty members um who are who write letters to rec for me I had to really like talk um um just like experience about me getting to know them more and and them getting to know me more um that was really valuable looks like our director has um, posed a follow-up question in the chat. So imposter syndrome uh, has been mentioned multiple times uh, by, by panelists um, and others. Do you find applying for these awards helped you get over imposter syndrome? Um, and if so, how, or do you need more time to get over imposter syndrome to apply? And um, how did you do it? Yeah. So. Uh... I think imposter syndrome is something that's uh, that's there for everyone. I don't think anyone's completely confident or 100% confident um, in, in what they do. But imposter syndrome 
it, you don't necessarily have to get over that feeling of imposter syndrome when you apply. Um, you can certainly apply to these scholarships and usually you will feel like once you press that submit button, you, you probably won't hear anything back. But when you do hear something back, it's sort of like, it, it's like a, as Lucy said, it's like a sign that, you know, you, you get some, some good feelings that, yeah, I'm actually part of this exclusive group or this exclusive uh, scholarship recipients, uh, th these people who have been proven by, by getting these scholarships as, um, you know, as, as prominent undergraduate researchers in, in the case of the Goldwater Scholarship. Um, so I don't think you necessarily need to get over imposter syndrome to apply, um, but it certainly, you know, if you do receive, a, if you do receive the award, then it certainly helps you uh, repress that for a little bit, but I don't think imposter syndrome ever goes away for anyone. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a great feeling to, to win an award and, and, you know, feel validated that you're able to, to be the best of the best. Um, but applying to these scholarships is always great. And, and, and just putting your, your, your chance in or, or applying is, is, is a great way to test out the waters and see how you're doing. All right, well, it looks like uh, several of our, um, several of our audience members are starting to ask questions. So maybe now is a great time to go ahead and segue into the Q&A portion of tonight's panel. Um, so if you have questions, um, you can type, take a little bit of time and type them in the chat or um, raise your hand. I think we have a question in the chat now. Let's see. So Daniel asked, uh, how can I receive other grants and scholarships to help pay for tuition? Um, so certainly financial need is a huge part of why people are applying for awards. Uh, nearly all of the awards that SOP advises for are external awards, um, and very few of them take uh, financial need into consideration. Um, however, the Office of Financial Aid uh, is a wonderful resource for need-based financial aid, um, and you know you can apply to a number of different awards through through that office. And they also have several uh, service-based scholarships as well that are uh, more extensive um, applications. Um, and, and Karishma has won several of those, such as the Barnes and Noble Scholarship and the um, Dalai Lama Scholarship that she can speak to as well. Um, and in addition to that, on our website, if you go to other opportunities, um, it's a, a section of our scholarships where we keep a huge database of a number of different external awards uh, that we don't advise for, but that you can apply for on your own. And, and some of them are need-based as well. Um, so it's really just kind of uh, familiarizing yourself with those resources and, and learning um, learning where, where, to, where to best pursue those opportunities because there are a lot of them out there. Uh, let's see, Yusuf says, sorry, you might've mentioned this, uh, but what year is best to apply uh, for one of the bigger awards? Um, so sophomores, juniors, seniors, and recent alum um, are served by our office. Um, and Aline just mentioned uh, the table um, has a column for intended graduation dates. Uh, most people apply as juniors and seniors. If you look up earlier in the chat, uh, you can see where I have linked to our scholarships page. Uh, and there's a portion of that page uh, that tells you kind of when to apply by eligibility and by when your graduation year is. Uh, for many of the graduate fellowships we advise for, students will start applying in spring of their junior year. Uh, and then if they win, then the funding will begin fall after their senior year. But that's not the only application uh, strategy for when you can apply. Some people like to take gap years um, and do other research experiences and things before heading to grad school. Um, it's, there's a lot of flexibility in the process. So we can't see who else typing right now. If you also want to just um, raise your hand or unmute and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Hello, I have a question. Go ahead. So hi, my name is Abhishek and I'm a freshman here. So my question is um, a lot of people have started NGOs and done a lot of research. 
So I'd like to ask the panelists, how did they, can they speak about how they managed their schoolwork with all these extracurricular stuff they did? Because obviously it's a huge commitment and it takes a lot of time and effort. So that's my question. I can answer a little bit of this one. Oh, and then Lucy can go after me. Uh, when it comes to, there's a lot of tools and I really believe that there's a strategic approach to managing your time effectively. Um, I can put some links in the chat about what I use, but definitely uh, plan your time out really well, Google Calendar, uh, very big one, you know, a basic tip. But um, there's a lot of resources when it comes to academic classes. So you can look on like Rate My Professor or there's this website called Zotistics that show you the distribution of like A's given out or something, right? And that gives you a kind of litmus test about, you know, what's the difficulty of this one class versus another class. And, you know, since you're a freshman, you get to really plan each year out and, uh, you know, try to balance that out. So say if you're, you know, if you're applying for a scholarship next year, um, and you know that it's going to be a really big undertaking, then you might want to put um, less course load and choose easier professors um, and put emphasis on that. Versus if you weren't, if you were um, not applying um, a certain year, so you could take, you know, additionally harder courses. But it really depends on your major as well. Some majors are more flexible than others. And uh, sometimes you might just have to, you know, stay up late sometimes. But um, for the most part, if you plan it out, well ahead of time, um, have it written down, then yeah. Yes, and I'll put Zotistics in the chat. I am a big proponent of it. You can literally find out the distribution of like, like grades given out. So you can figure out, you know, the a sort of how much effort relative that you want to put in. Um, I think for me, 100% um, second Stevens um, recommendation for a Google Calendar. I love a Google Calendar is that it can actually ping your phone for reminders. Every meeting I have, everything, uh, all the deadlines, I have my phone remind me. Um, and then another thing is, I know I hate to say this, but um, it's really worked for me, is you have to learn how to say no and you have to make sacrifices. Um, and you have to learn to sacrifice the things that, um, that, that can be sacrificed. And um, I kind of had to learn this the hard way. Like there are things that like, don't sacrifice your health, whether physical or mental, don't sacrifice sleep meals. Um, but um, the hard, cold hard truth is that sometimes in order to manage, you do have to sacrifice. Like you have to say no to your friends if they want to hang out. Um, like if you know you have an assignment due, you know that you maybe like you can't really go out that night. Or um, if you know you have a lot of work on a weekend, you know, like you maybe don't want to go go party too hard on Friday night. <laughs> um, I think like, I think that like the sacrifice of self-control is, is um, something really important for to learning how to balance everything. Leon has a question in the chat as well uh, around how much time commitment does applying for uh, a scholarship require? So I can give you the short answer in terms of our advising processes. Um, four to six months um, is the actual application process. Um, so for example, our spring cycle awards um, begin uh, early April, and we are just now finishing those applications up for those. Uh, for our fall cycle awards, they begin end of October, beginning of November, and we finish most of those up in March. Um, so that's the advising period. Um, but I think some of our scholars can tell you that there's, there's work that goes into that um, beyond just the advising and application period too, in terms of all, all the research um, work they're doing ahead of time, all the faculty relationships they're doing ahead of time, things like that. Um, it's just, it's kind of really a continual process. And let's see, a lot of scholarships list things like 45 to 48 awards on the webpage. What does that mean? That refers to how many awards that scholarship agency gives out each year. Um, yeah.
Let's see, are there any scholarships for um, students who maintain a high GPA? Um, so the GPAs that we put on our website are um, guides. There are a few scholarships that do have GPA minimums. Uh, some of the UK awards like Marshall um, have a 3.7 uh, minimum. Goldwater, it's very, very rare for, for a Goldwater winner to have lower than a 3.7 minimum GPA. Um, and then there are other awards that we advise for that are more GPA flexible. Um, Fulbright being one of those. Um, so Fulbright is um, you know, one, of the, one of the largest awards out there with over 11,000 applications in every field imaginable. Um, and there, there are plenty of people who are competitive for Fulbright at, at 3.0. Mm -hmm. Other questions in the chat? Is the contact info page sharing correctly? It is. Okay. So yeah, if you have any questions that come up later that you may have not uh, you were too shy to ask now or you didn't think of them, feel free to email us or schedule an advising appointment with the student advisor. So Isha, Yusuf, or myself, and we can help you on Zoom or in person and walk you through all the steps for applying to a scholarship through SOP Advising. And yes, uh, okay, so Isha answered that. Yes, we do offer Zoom consulting. You can find out about it on our webpage. Um, 3.8 GPA uh, for an engineering major versus a political science major. Um, you know, some awards, um, you know, do take into consideration, you know, the, the various um, depressed GPAs that certain major ha majors have um, versus others, but um, really a big part of your scholarship comes down to your, your narrative, your ideas, your research. Um, you know, some of them do do have on average high GPAs, but it's really about your your own narrative and you know the interest uh, in your research and the things that you put together in that application that matter the most. Um, transfer students uh, can still apply. So many many um, many uh, scholarships take a composite of your GPA. So you you'll calculate GPA uh, with your transfer. Um, grades combined with the ones that you'll eventually start getting at UCI. So that transfer um, GPA carries over. Okay. Any, any last questions from anyone? Yes, you can still apply this quarter. Um, so if you follow the links earlier on, if you go to our advising page, you can find out about joining SOP Prep, which is a three-hour open enrollment course. The link is up, um, up there, and that um, kind of initiates your advising process. And then we also have uh, pre-application deadlines for all of our uh, fall cycle awards. Uh, so October 25th is going to be the deadline for um, our research awards. Um, and our public, our um, postgraduate internship awards. And then November 8th is gonna be our pre-application deadline for our public service awards. Joseph, yes, um, to answer your question, UCI does have awards for um, merit-based scholarships and you would have to go through the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships for that because the awards that SOP, our office advises for are all externally funded. Great. Okay. Well, we are at the hour now, so I want to thank again um, our panelists, Karishma, Pratush, Lucy, and Stephen, uh, and thank you all for coming to attend tonight. If you didn't get to answer your question, we are going to make a recording of this available uh, later on. And of course, you can contact us uh, through the email that we just had up there, visit our website for advising. Um, thank you again all for coming. Best of luck to you in this quarter, and we, and we hope to hear from you sometime in the near future. Thanks a lot. <laughs>